cosmic clock, the cosmic catastrophe cycle. These topics have been discussed for eons. And many of you have just heard about it in recent years. But tonight, we're going to uncover some of the science and geology that support the cosmic clock cycle or the cosmic catastrophe cycle. And this all has to do with the paper coming out and some research that we're going to share with you now. Where a mammoth tusk was recovered from an unlikely place, the bottom of the ocean. Now the ocean's dark depths hold many secrets. And for more than three decades, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has been exploring the deep waters off the coast of Central California. During an expedition aboard the RV Western Flyer in 2019, pilot Randy Prickett and scientist Steve Haddock made a peculiar observation. While exploring a seamount located 300 kilometers or about 185 miles offshore of California and in 3,000 meters of depth or 10,000 feet, the team spotted what looked like an elephant tusk. Only able to collect a small piece at the time, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute returned in July of this year to retrieve the complete specimen. Now, Haddock and researchers from the Paleo Genomics Lab and UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute and the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of California, Santa Cruz and the Museum of Paleontology at the University of Michigan are examining the tusk. And that's a boom. Now, the researchers have confirmed that the tusk, which is about one meter, is from a Colombian mammoth or Mammuthus columbi. Now, the cold, high pressure environment of the deep sea uniquely preserved the tusk, giving researchers the opportunity to study it in great detail. Using computed tomography scans will reveal the full three-dimensional internal structure of the tusk, tusk and information about the animal's history, such as its age. Fascinating. You start to expect the unexpected when exploring the deep sea. But I'm still stunned that we came upon an ancient tusk of a mammoth. We are grateful to have a multidisciplinary team analyzing this remarkable specimen, including geochronologists, oceanographers, paleogenomicists, and paleontologists at the University of Michigan. Now, their work examining this exciting discovery is just beginning, and we're looking forward to sharing more information in the future on this discovery. Now, this specimen's deep sea preservation environment is different from almost anything we've seen elsewhere, says paleontologist Daniel Fisher, who specializes in the study of mammoths and mastodons. Other mammoths have been retrieved from the ocean, but generally not from depths of more than a few tens of meters. This came from a thousand feet of water, hundred plus miles offshore. So this is quite fascinating to say the least. Now, a team of researchers from the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at USC will investigate when and how the tusk may have arrived deep offshore. The team believes it could be the oldest well-preserved mammoth tusk recovered from this region of North America. And dating of the tusk is being done by the USCS Geochronology Lab led by Terence Blackburn, Associate Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Blackburn analyzed radioscopes to show the tusk is more than 100,000 years old. Our age estimate on the tusk is largely based on the natural radioactive decay of certain uranium and thorium isotopes imparted to the tusk. 
And so this is aligning with the proxy data, which we're going to go over in a moment. Now, the researchers at the USCC, USSC Paleogenomics Lab, led by Beth Shapiro, professor of ecology and evolutionary biology, planned to sequence the ancient DNA from the specimen, which could provide valuable insight into how mammoths colonized North America. Now, Shapiro and Moon will recover ancient DNA preserved within the matrix of the tusk, which they compared to DNA that has already been recovered from other mammoths at other times. Specimens like this present a rare opportunity to paint a picture both of an animal that used to be alive and of the environment in which it lived, said Shapiro. Mammoth remains from continental North America are particularly rare. And so we expect that DNA from this tusk will go far to refine what we know about mammoths in this part of the world. Now, the ocean represents 99% of the space where, we, where life can exist. And we still know very little about it, and most of it is unexplored. An interest in exploiting the deep sea by mining for valuable metals has grown, with the potential to place many marine animals in harm's way. And this surprising discovery, hidden on the seafloor for eons, serves as a fragile reminder of the many remaining mysteries worthy of our protection. And they're only being discovered due to the exploit of the planet. Now, this discovery not only is groundbreaking, but it's a great detractor from all the crustal slip theories that have been flooding the internet in recent years. Now, let's delve deeper. Is this accidentally a tusk just sitting on the seafloor in a pristine environment? Or has it been sitting there for 120,000 years untouched? And that's our supposition. Based on the pictures of how they found it, it's not broken, it's not damaged, it's weathered in place for 120,000 years. Let's just take a look at it lying on the sea floor. You can see here that it's just sitting there. It's not buried, it's not fractured, it's just sitting there. But I digress. Let's go over the science of the mammoth and the fact that this is deposited there over 100,000 years ago. Probably because of the cosmic catastrophe or the clock cycle. Which, by the way, comes directly from the zodiac wheel. The zodiac wheel represents an entire cycle of the procession of the equinoxes. And this is represented by the cosmic clock catastrophe cycle here, which was created by Randall Carlson almost a decade ago, where all geologic known catastrophes are overlain onto a zodiac wheel. I know this is heresy, but based on the information we know as scientists, astrology or the astrological wheel is the precursor to all science on the planet. And for good reason, because in modern times, we've now correlated it to all cosmic catastrophes which line up on certain flexure points of destruction, which are biblical, literally. And you're looking at the epic of data. This is the Antarctic ice cores, which go back 400,000 plus years. And they show a repetitive 100,000 year cycle of catastrophe. The last catastrophic sea level rise or Noah's flood happened 12,900 years ago and ended 11,400 years ago at the peak of the rise. 100,000 years prior to that, the same exact cycle occurred. 100,000 years prior to that, the same exact cycle occurred, and so on and so forth. A repetitive clock. Tick tock. Now, 
within those major cycles are Heinrich events. And a Heinrich event is any series of at least six discharges of icebergs that carry coarse grain rocky debris and mammoth tusks, apparently from North American ice sheets into the North Atlantic between latitudes 40 and 55. So ice breaks up in the Arctic, travels south, gets dropped just above 40 degrees north, which is like, let's say, Virginia or central California, however you want to look at it. But Heinrich events are only described in the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, not in the Pacific. But clearly they could have been happening at the same time if it's a breakdown of the glacial system, which we are seeing here. You see major ice ages that occur for 100,000 years, a warming in an interglacial, and then an 80,000-year ice age, a warming in an interglacial, and repeat, and repeat, and repeat, and we're going to repeat. And this is all visible on high-resolution proxy data graphs, like what, the one you're looking at here, which goes back 140,000 years. So here's the last major catastrophe prior to the Younger Dryas, and then the Younger Dryas event, which is a repeat of this event. And in the interim, you have interglacials and one, two, three, four, five pulses of warming and cooling. Now, those pulses correspond directly to the Milankovitch cycles. Now, the Milankovitch cycles were my entire focus in my graduate studies at university, Temple University, as a geologist. It was the main focus on my thesis that cosmic ca catastrophe cycles driven by Milankovitch cycles on Earth are the reason why stratigraphic cycles get preserved. And these stratigraphic cycles are visible in all quarries everywhere in the world, wherever the rocks are still flat lying and untouched. And you can see a re repetition of this bed and this bed and this bed. And we'll just take that cycle. And in each of these packages, boom, 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 we see smaller cycles. So what you're looking at is here is 100,000 year, 100,000, another 100,000, another 100,000, and, and again. And these 100,000 year cycles are what we see in the proxy data. It's what we see right here in Vostok. A big boom, and then one, two, three, four, five other cycles. One, two, three, four, five. And these are some of them are packaged in twos. This would be an obliquity cycle. This all has to do with the Milankovitch orbital perturbations. Every 100,000 years, we get further and closer to the sun. Every 40,000 years, there is a change in the width of this axis or the and the axial tilt. So the orbit gets fatter and thinner. That's the obliquity. The precession is the wobble, which happens every 24,000, 25,000 years or so. So you should expect four of these cycles, two of these cycles, and every one of these cycles. It's called a nested hierarchy of cycles. Well, and we can see it in the data. Clearly, we can see every 100,000-year cycle is boom, boom, boom. Within it, there's one, two, three, four, five processions. One, two, three, four, five processions. And sometimes two processions in one obliquity, like here and here, maybe here and here, another obliquity. And this all corresponds to the waning and waxing of the ice and the Heinrich events and the stratigraphic cycles and the repetition of ice age after ice age and eon after eon of mass extinction and mass extinction. All thanks to the sun. Nothing else is controlling this. The Earth's position to the sun is relegated by the Milankovitch cyclicity. Now, Moton Milankovitch came up with these patterns back in the 1920s. He hypothesized that variations in eccentricity, axial tilt, which is precession, 
resulted in cyclical variations in the solar radiation reaching Earth, and that this orbital forcing strongly influenced the Earth's climate patterns. <laughs> now, many people have poo-pooed this, and I still think this has a great influence on what's going on. Because we see it in the rock record. It goes back hundreds of millions of years, all the way through the Cambrian and even further. It goes, it's base and wide. It's all over the world. Everywhere I've looked, in Europe, in Spain, in other countries, all over the U.S., east, west, north, south. The same cycles in all quarries where there are flat-lying sedimentary rocks. And this should rock your world. Because many people basically discounted this completely 30 years ago because of global warming. And this was my baby. This is why I got into academia. And this is also why I left academia because there was no funding with the global warming boom. But it is clear today in every quarry, in any place where there is stratigraphy available to view, that the Milankovitch cycles that are a nested hierarchy of orbital perturbations are alive and well in the rock record. Now, maybe these orbital perturbations have something to do with our sun, or maybe they don't. Maybe Mut Milankovitch came up with his orbital perturbations based on data sets, well, that are not quite right, and they have something more to do with a galactic cosmic wave, potentially something that's been so pervasive that it's existed for hundreds of millions of years. And we're going to delve into that in the next podcast where we can bring you up to speed with which why the proxy data has changed in the last 5 million years. We went from an obliquity cycle to a processional cycle. Here's some recent data. Here's the last 120,000 years that are picking up the Bond and the Donskard Erschger cycles. It's not because something has changed, in my opinion. It's because the data in recent times is more well preserved. And the older stuff, because of catastrophe after catastrophe, gets destroyed like a boom. The cosmic clock is real. And I know correlation is not causation. But this many layers of inquiry and proxy data and correlations are not accidental. And for the last 30 plus years, I have been looking for the mechanism. And I don't think there's one answer. I think it's a composite of answers that all play on each other. And we're just beginning to understand what's actually happening. And that's a boom to knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. As we are scientists, in just the beginning of understanding of some of the most, some of the deepest topics on planet Earth, this explains everything the hidden history, the lost civilizations, Noah's flood, so on and so forth. Stick with us. We're going to bring you up to speed piece by piece, layer by layer, proxy data by proxy data. And that's a boom to knowledge. Share this with like-minded people. Thanks to all our one-time donors, our Patreons, the heroes that share this video. 35 years of science in my brain. And there are very few people that have been thinking about this this long. Paul Lavallette is one of them, but he does not know the other information that I have studied. And together, we will unravel the cosmic clock together. One podcast at a time, one day at a time. We will do it. We love each and every one of you. Be safe. And that's a boom. Stay tuned for more booms. Mm -hmm.